Hello, and welcome to the debrief from the business of fashion, where each week we go deep on our most popular BOF professional stories with the correspondents who created them. I'm Lauren Sherman. Every generation complains about the one that comes after it. Baby boomers said Gen X was lazy, Gen X complained that millennials were annoying, and Gen Z, everyone thinks they're too demanding. And in fact, thanks to a low unemployment rate and booming economy, they are. Early career professionals are asking for and often receiving salaries that are 30% higher than typical for their experience level. But while many fashion companies are performing well right now, executives are worried that promising these young employees too much could backfire when business gets tough. Today with me, I have BOF senior correspondent, Sheena Butler-Young, who recently documented the power struggle between fashion companies and their entry-level employees. Sheena, thanks so much for being here. So tell me, what brought you to this story initially? You know, it's funny because my focus at BOF is workplace talent and culture. So it makes sense for me to be having conversations with executives and leaders in the industry about talent trends, things like hiring and retaining talent. But what's interesting about this idea is it actually came to me from my colleagues as well, like across the team for at least the past six months and probably more like a year, when we were having conversations with people across the industry leaders, regardless of what you're talking about, it could be whether the runway trends or what's hot for fall or a marketing story or a sustainability story, often we were finding that somewhere in the conversation with executives, they would find a way to mention, oh, by the way, I'm really struggling with junior talent, hiring and retaining them. So that was sort of the burst impetus of why I wanted to explore this story. Their concerns really came down to a couple things. The first one was around salary demands. A lot of executives were telling me and my colleagues that they felt like entry-level and junior employees were demanding salaries that really does not match their experience level and, quite frankly, their eventual performance if they are hired. And I think a lot of it is also, the second part of it is around these expectations that all generations have, but particularly the early career professionals or the Gen Zers, those early 20-somethings, around flexibility and things like remote work and work-life balance. It's coming from every generation, but especially this one. And they have really been struggling to meet those demands, balancing their needs as a company to be more progressive with concerns around P&L and and business needs. I am one of your colleagues and have experienced this. Every CEO or executive I talk to is like hiring is so difficult. No one wants to come into the office. I just want to throw out this text. I'm not going to reveal who sent it to me, but it's a CEO of a, I want to say about a $10 million business in the fashion industry. And they said, BTW need to do an article on how hiring is impossible. All the kids left New York or want like 130K for jobs with five years experience or less. And it kind of just summed up. I think the next week we all had this discussion of what you've been hearing and it felt like such a vital story and you were able to talk to quite a few people for the piece, quite a few executives who laid it out for you. And you gave an example of this executive Shai Eisenman, who is trying to hire, I think it was 10 employees for her brand, Bubble Skincare. What specific challenges did she face? How did she sort of lay it out to you? So here's what I found really interesting about Shai. She is very Gen Z first, right? Bubble Skincare is all about Gen Z. Gen Z is their core consumer demographic. She spent four years learning about, researching about Gen Z before she even launched Bubble Skincare. She says she interviewed 10,000 Gen Zers in those four years. And to this day, she makes it a point to talk to one to 10 Gen Zers a day because she values the youth perspective right? She is an expert in her own right on this cohort. Yet that hasn't really gotten her much further ahead than her peers when it comes to hiring and retaining this group. She's saying it takes her now longer to find talent because she says that they are impatient, that 
she thinks that this is a generation that grew up with a iPhone in their hands, brimming with these sort of overnight success stories of YouTubers and TikTok stars who, in a matter of weeks or months, have become millionaires based off trending viral content. And so they really lack the patience of contending with an entry-level job where you spend you know, years sort of acquiring new skills and proving yourself before you get the next promotion or the next raise. They really want it all right now. And she hopes that, or what she's struggling with, is that that experience needs to catch up with the demands. This is what she says are her big issues with the group. And she's not really cracked the code yet. We're going to hear a little bit from Shy right now. I think Gen Zers are the complete opposite of millennials and the yeah. complete opposite of Gen X. I think they are completely different. I think they look for different things. I think also they lack patience. Everything in the world is very fast paced. We worked with content creators that grew 100,000 followers a week. And Gen Zers are seeing those very fast-paced growth across celebrities, across influencers, around content creators, around all the TikTok self-advice, <laughs> I became a CEO at 19 mm-hmm. videos. And again, like all of this content that they're consuming is so subjective and it's half truths and it's not necessarily telling the full picture. Gen Z is hardly the first generation to be accused of impatience upon entering the workforce. I'm an old millennial and millennials were also stereotyped as needy and disloyal and all that stuff when we were entering. But then the millennial narrative changed into this sort of workhorse thing and Gen Z viewed millennials as workhorses, but you know, still annoying or what have you. And that seems to be what Gen Z is rebelling against. Can you talk a bit more about that and the differences between the Gen X millennial and Gen Z attitude and the similarities as well? The challenging thing, and this is always been the case is when we or the thought leaders and experts try to define a generation, right, is especially in their younger years, we always try to put some parameters around understanding their behaviors. But obviously, no two people are alike and no generation is a monolith. Not everyone's going to follow this to a T. That's a given. The other part is that a lot of these behavioral parameters will evolve. Most people in their 20s, it's it's always been the case that 20-somethings have been defined as, as impatient. And that tends to show up or manifest years down the line as something else. So that's always the challenge with defining generations. Millennials wanted a lot of the same things that Gen Z does now. I spoke with a recruiter for the story, Craig Rowley, who's also a brand consultant that's been doing this for 30 years. I won't say his age, but he's not a millennial or a Gen Z. He recalls wanting the same thing in his 20s. You know, he wanted to move up quickly. You start working and you're not exactly happy with what you see a day-to-day life will look like when you're first entering the workforce. Some of these things are normal or expected for 20-somethings. The difference between Gen Z and millennial when they enter the workforce, millennials, I don't know if you were in this position, Lauren, but we graduated or entered the workforce right around the Great Recession. I wanted career mobility. I wanted a higher salary, but I couldn't really ask for it. I sort of took what I could get. I remember being very desperate. Gen Z is entering the workforce amid a labor shortage. There's a lot of, I can you know tell you the data, like in March, U.S. employers had 11.5 million job openings while there were 5 million people looking for work. That is a gap not seen since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started collecting the data in 2000. So that's real leverage behind the demands that they're making. Employers are also yielding to the demands. So I love this thing that uh, one of the recruiters said that I I didn't put it in the story. Her name is Paula Reed. She said, nothing's unreasonable if the market supports it, right? So if you're asking for XYZ salary for a job in, I don't know, let's say using software for a computer and you get that right now, 10 years down the line, if we're no longer using that software and you're not needed, that salary is no longer reasonable. So it's sort of the same thing with Gen Z right now. What they're asking for currently the market supports. If millennials had asked for this X, Y, Z years ago, if boomers had asked for it or Gen X had asked for it, the market would not have supported it then. And we'll probably get into this later, but you know, the market does change again. Yeah. It's always changing. So for 
executives, employers right now, how should they manage this? Because they have to hire people. They don't have to. Elon Musk just put a hiring freeze on all of Tesla or what have you. But if they need to fill positions, how do they manage these expectations and work towards a better work-life balance and progressive policies but also you have to make money. So how do you kind of balance all the different forces at work here? Yeah, I think that what you just said is the crux of it. It's we know that people were working pre-pandemic, working parents and Gen Xers who have aging parents and caregiving responsibilities. So there were a lot of things wrong with the work-life balance or lack thereof. So we know that companies need to evolve some of their HR policies. That's one of the good things that have come out of this. But there are true issues around P&L, profit and loss balance sheets and making money. And those issues are not just for the company. If we enter a recession and you're making a salary that's 20, 30% higher than maybe is typical, your job could be vulnerable. So th- these are considerations on all sides. One of the things that I think is important that I've heard from experts is trying to understand what it is that Gen Z really wants and not making assumptions. Yes, there's true data and proof that they're getting higher salaries, but because you come into the interview process loaded with that information, it's very easy to assume that questions from this group means that they want automatic promotions or outsized wages. Often they just want communication or communication trumps a lot of the other things that they may want. They want to know where their career is headed. Craig Rowley uh, said this very well, that in fashion, if you come in as a part-time merchandiser, they want to know how long before I become a full-time merchandiser or a senior merchandiser. And if you say, oh, five years, well, why does it take five years? They have a lot of information at their fingertips and they really want to understand things because they're used to having information drive their decisions and just how they engage in the world. So that's the first thing is to not make assumptions about what they want. The other thing that I really, really love, and I think it has applicability beyond this story or this topic is Paula Reed said this really interesting thing, figure out who you are as a company and screen against that, not who you want to be, right? Think about all the ways that shows up in life. But so many companies in fashion, especially where everything is about being on trend, the knee jerk reaction to things that are happening on social media or elsewhere, like the wellness trend and work life balance, the knee jerk reaction is to start putting out marketing and messaging around that when what's happening internally does not match that. So fashion is notorious for people working long, hard hours. If it is your cultural norm that everyone's working 20 hours a day, but you're messaging to potential hires that you're wellness focused, you're not actually living that value. Should you get there? Absolutely. But should you be marketing that before it's reality? No, because Gen Z really hates being sold things and worse, things that are not true. They hate inauthenticity. So that's going to really shoot companies in the foot if they're not actually having the rhetoric match the reality. I think the other important thing is a focus on over-communication and, and progressive policies in the HR department. I'm not privy to all the nuts and bolts of HR policies, but I think having a lot of flexibility baked in there you know, it, it, there's no silver bullet, but we know that this generation and many generations want to have the ability to work from home sometimes. What that looks like will vary from company to company. They want to be able to have children or care for their parents or focus on their mental wellness and not have that be seen as a disadvantage to them or have their careers suffer as a result. All of these kinds of thinking should be baked into the HR policies that you have. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Imran Ahmed, founder and CEO of The Business of Fashion. When I first started writing BOF, it was out of pure passion for this industry and with an eye to how the disruptive forces of digitization, globalization, and consumer shifts would change the way fashion works. 15 years later, we are well on our way to helping to define the fashion business of the future. As I travel the world, some of you ask me, what's the best way to support BOF? as we continue to act as your guide during these turbulent times. The best way to support BOF is to support our journalism by joining BOF Professional, the largest community of fashion professionals in the world. 
A BOF professional membership gives you access to our agenda setting insights and analysis, which you won't find anywhere else. Plus the opportunity to learn from our talented team, of correspondents and editors, as well as our wider network of the fashion industry's leading creatives, thinkers and futurists. Follow the link in the episode notes to learn more. I think after the salary thing, the work from home thing, it might be coming up even more for certain people, for certain young employees. But how do you manage that? Because as someone I've worked kind of from home my whole career, I think I had one job where I had to go in at 930 and had to stay until 530 or what have you. Every other job I've been able to do a bit of work from home and the majority of it in many cases. But I work very independently. You work very independently. It's pretty easy for us to just do our Zoom meetings and get out. But in fashion and in many industries, but in a creative industry like fashion, a design team or even a marketing team, a lot of that is collaborative. And having that FaceTime with people, especially when you're a new employee and you've never worked in an office, feels so necessary. Is that just an old fashioned way of working? or thinking, and you just have to adapt to the new normal of doing everything more virtually. But how do you see different companies approaching it? It has been probably the biggest challenge from an HR standpoint for many companies, especially because fashion has design teams, retail uh, stores have stores and fulfillment centers. Like So much of retail right now, quite frankly, we can't call it old school because as it stands has to happen in person, especially those store level, entry level roles and fulfillment centers, they have to happen that way. What's interesting is that I've spoken to companies that say it's actually the early career professionals that they actually want to have an appetite to experience some of the workplace rituals like happy hour or going to a conference room. Remember, Gen Z is probably never, many of them have never been in an office. So there is a little bit of an appetite that I think companies are finding that if they're crafty, they can sort of play into that and make coming to work everything that they've sold it as before Gen Z didn't get to enter the workforce. So I think that's one strategy. If you say it's all about team building and culture, when you get into the office, you have to meet that when people are there. You have to have it feel like what you say it is, because there is a group of early career professionals They say, they tell me that really want to be a part of this. The onus is on the companies to have it live up to what we say it should be. I think another important tool here to remember what I've heard from companies is that work from home, hybrid is not a cure-all. Even that has to have parameters, right? So for example, I think this was uh, the CEO of Revlon in a story talked about, if you say we're in a hybrid, people get excited, but then you add to it. You have to come in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Like, no excuses. Those are the days that everyone's in. That doesn't really scream flexibility. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's hybrid is not a silver bullet. It sounds like when you're contending with, you know, these demands around flexibility that hybrid would be a cure-all. Companies really have to be thoughtful and intentional about what even the flexible policies look like. But I would say the bottom line is that you have to live whatever it is you're selling. So if you want to have people come into the office and there's room for that, I don't think it's altogether old school. Whatever you say the office should bring, make sure when they get there, it is brought, that there's collaboration, there's mentorship, that if you say, when you come in, you get FaceTime with your manager or your supervisor, make sure that's actually happening because that's what's going to build resentment around this group if you have them coming in and they're not getting anything from it sitting at a cubicle all day or or what have you. Totally. It's a really good point. And these are things that you can do that don't necessarily cost extra money. They just take extra effort and I assume will make the working environment and the performance go up in standard or what have you. Absolutely. One thing that's good for employers to remember is that you're worried about these people you're bringing in who are younger, they're going to require more training in many cases, more hands-on work. But then you have this whole cohort of employees who are maybe not early career, as you said, maybe they've been around for a while and maybe some of them are a bit mid-level and they're not super senior. They're not at where they want to be just yet. How do you show them that you still appreciate them? Because not only is 
hiring people difficult right now, but there's tons of turnover at companies as well. The internal wage equity thing has become, if we talk about Gen Z being sort of the bane of existence for some of these executives right now, I think that's the second part that's maybe the follow-up bane to their existence because you've got this veteran workforce in a lot of cases, you know, the generations that preceded millennials and Gen Zers, they're the lifers. They've shown you loyalty. And Paula Reed said this, said you have to think about how you're going to reward and cater to those people that have been loyal to you while attracting the talent you need from the outside. What that looks like often is wage transparency and then wage correction. And that's, I think, the other PNL pressure. And I'm I'm very careful around calling it that because I know there's in public discourse a lot of concern that Companies are saying they can't meet these demands when they can, but for all intents and purposes, these executives are saying this has become a real financial burden on P&L when you have to start doing all this wage correction. You also have to manage from an HR standpoint, resentment. I don't know about you, Lauren, but I've seen that in my career. You get to a company, there's someone that's been there 40 years and they know or they sense that someone that's coming in this week is being able to make more demands. It seems like the management team is sort of yielding to stuff or elevating them quickly because remember, younger generations do want a clear career trajectory and sometimes they do want to be promoted rather quickly. And when you start doing that to cater to young talent, you've got to manage fallout among your veteran workforce. And it's it's really an HR thing. Is there a cure-all or a resolution that's emerged? No, I think it's transparency and communication, very old school, but that's what companies are trying to do. And then also mitigate P&L pressures when you start to have to do all this wage matching and correction. It's challenging. And I think you're right that especially larger companies, certain, a lot of them have shareholders. They want to deliver the most profits possible to those shareholders. And so they probably could be paying people more. And then there are the smaller companies that are not turning a profit or barely turning a profit and and they kind of don't know how to make it work. It's That's a company by company thing, but it's it's definitely challenging. I think my last question for you is we keep hearing, and I feel like the last few weeks on the pod, we've been talking about the R word and recession and Everything, people are starting to feel a little bit worried, even though we have no idea what's going to happen. There was just a recession two years ago, even though that recession was not a normal recession. We we don't know what's about to happen. But at some point, unemployment is going to rise. It might be a year from now. It might be five years from now. It will. That's the cycle of the economy or what have you. And what's going to happen is that the terms are going to be more in favor of the employers once again. How do you see it all shaking out? Do you think there's going to be a bit of a correction where sooner than later, where employers have an opportunity to take back a bit of that negotiating power? And short answers, yes. I think what I'm hearing is across retail, companies are sort of sounding the alarm on softening demand and the potential for the R word. Macroeconomically, we have indicators that sort of precede a recession. And one of them is, you know, inflation when periods of high inflation often precede economic recession. And I think anyone that's been to the grocery store know we're seeing unprecedented inflation. So that's there. The other thing that you're looking for is geopolitical uncertainty. That's certainly happening. We have war in Ukraine and ongoing concerns about all of these COVID variants and mutations of the virus. So there's a lot of uncertainty around international trade. Consumer prices are up 8.3% over the past year. So a lot of the macroeconomic backdrop points in that direction. And a lot of retail trends and retail experts are saying they're seeing this sort of softening demand, which precedes that. It really goes back to from the employer standpoint, from the industry standpoint, accountability, this role and obligation that employers have to sort of manage expectations in a way that's mutually beneficial for the long term. We know that at some point, if you start paying people, you know, 30, 40 percent, Craig said that sometimes it's high as 50 percent higher. And then you're you're sort of poaching talent and encouraging people to leave jobs that they've only been at for a year and a half and throwing your weight around in that. And you know that we're on the outside of a recession. In a year from now, those people will be probably your most vulnerable to layoffs because we know companies tend to reward loyalty if they're going to start putting people on the chopping block. It might be the people that are earning the highest wages and they may not feel like those people 
really deserve that wages. So you've got to manage their expectations in a way that is mutually beneficial. It benefits them to be cautious of their own career trajectory, and it benefits you to secure the long-term buy-in of your workforce to develop and hone the talent that you need. So it's a two-way street, but I think a lot of the ownership does fall on companies here. Many BOF professional members, employers, and employees alike are going to be relying on you in the next few months to keep us updated on the story and provide the best guidance because it's uncharted territory, I guess. Absolutely. Well, I'm here. Thank you for joining us today. It was so great to chat. Thank you, Lauren. You have been listening to The Debrief, produced and edited by Emma Clark, Kate Vartan, and Eric Bria in the BOF studio. I'm Lauren Sherman, and I'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Thanks so much for joining us, and be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. You can join BOF Professional today with an exclusive 25% discount on an annual membership covering key industry topics from sustainability to technology to marketing with access to our case studies, live events, and iOS app. To get this special offer and benefit from 25% off of a membership, head to the link in the episode show notes or enter the coupon code DEBRIEF at checkout. Visit businessoffashion.com slash memberships. Thank you.